All right. Well, praise the Lord. We are in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 1 through 4. Everybody ready? Got your Bibles? Y'all ready to go? Got the screen set up? Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Here we go. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. So essentially, I gave to this morning's message a pretty simple title. If I'm justified, what does that really mean to me? I don't know if you've ever experienced what I'm about to talk to you about, but there's been a long time, a long time really before I knew the Lord, and it really it, it bled into the, a time frame after I knew the Lord that I walked around for quite some time with this feeling of guilt in my life. I can remember, this may seem a little bit silly. I'm going to talk a little bit about myself this morning, but it's not because I want to talk about myself. I'm using myself as an illustration, okay? Because I couldn't find a better story really to tell you. But, but this is one concept that I can remember sitting on the couch when we lived on this little street, this street in Elmwood and Lafayette. And I was really quite a mess. I was bound up with drugs and alcohol, just this big old party scene kind of thing. And anyway, I was sitting on that couch and I was thinking to myself, I probably shouldn't admit all this with all these kids in here. But, you know, I, why do I feel so guilty right now? Like, I, I haven't stolen anything since last week. I haven't. <laughs> I, I, I really didn't do anything that I could really remember really bad. But I had this overwhelming feeling of guilt and I had already been introduced to the gospel and I had even gone up to the front and, and you know, allowed, prayed the prayer as a, as a 13 year old. I didn't, I didn't know to connect that feeling that I was having with the fact that I wasn't right with the Lord. I just knew that was really the Holy Spirit allowing me to feel <laughs> yeah. the conviction that he was trying to get a hold of me. But at the same time, the devil was trying to condemn me. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> This feeling even bled over into my Christian walk. I mean, I can tell you that for quite some time in my Christianity, I felt this cloud of guilt that loomed or hung over my head. And I never really felt a true feeling of forgiveness or freedom or, or whatever the case. Now, I have to tell you that many of the churches that I went to didn't really talk a whole lot about justification. Uh, you know, really, the Baptists have do a much better job teaching on justification than what most Pentecostals do. Thank God for Brother Swaggart's ministry because now we're seeing that really change. But I can tell you, and some of you that have gotten saved like after I've known you, like some of, there's a few of you in here, a couple of you anyway, that got saved, that, or maybe you got saved beforehand, but more the teaching and understanding as we've become friends and known one another, you haven't necessarily been in some of the type of churches that I've been in. Some of us in here though have been in some of those types of churches. And what I'm talking about is I'm talking about charismatic or Pentecostal churches. And I have to tell you that in a lot of those churches, justification just wasn't taught. It, 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 was, it was more about the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. And we love the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit and we need more of it. Amen. But good, solid foundation and doctrine wasn't, wasn't really taught. And so without an understanding of justification and what it really means, it's, it's impossible for the believer to be able to walk in freedom and liberty and to be able to walk in, in, in a way that the, that the cloud of guilt is no longer looming over their head, right? Uh, once again, I didn't want to necessarily talk about myself, but that was one occurrence. There was something else that happened when I was about 17, and I'm, and I'm going to, you know, listen... I hate to admit this, but one time I told this kid in the clinic a story about something that I did whenever I was 17 or when I was 15. And this and I was using it for the purpose of talking to him about Jesus. And then this kid turns around and he does it. I got me and I stole my dad's car when I was 15. And I ran away to California and I told this story. And this kid turns around and he does what I told. And the purpose of the story wasn't for this kid to steal his, a car or to run away to California, the purpose of the story was to tell the redeeming story of Jesus Christ, amen, and how God changes people's lives. So don't none of you 
eight-year-old or 10-year-old or 12-year-old trying to steal your parents' car and run away to California. <laughs> anyway, that's not the story I want to tell you. There was a situation when I was 17 uh, when I was working at this place that was a, it was a bar. And this woman, really what had happened was is that it turned into an after-hours party for the employees. And when it came time to get paid, there was no money to pay because it had become this perpetual party is what was happening. And so me and a friend of mine, we felt like we were entitled to our payment, even though we really weren't doing anything what we were supposed to do. We just felt like she was supposed to pay us and it was time for us to get paid. Well, so since she wasn't going to pay us, we were going to take matters into our own hands. And I hate to admit this to you, but I broke into that place when I was about 17 years old and we stole 21 cases of beer and three kegs of beer. Well, make a long story short, we ended up getting... You know, somebody said something, and next thing you know, I'm in the police department. Well, one of the things that I didn't know is that you're really supposed to kind of let your lawyer handle a lot of that, and I felt real guilty about what I had done, so I just kind of spilled the beans right there, and I told him, man, it was me. I didn't tell him nobody else, but I said, yeah, it was me. I did this. I ain't giving nobody else his name, blah, blah, blah. Well, so my dad was real concerned about the situation, and so what he did was immediately he represented me. He contacted the woman. He said, ma'am, can I please meet with you? I got to take care of some business. So he met with this woman and he wrote her a check. How much do you feel like you were out for what my son has done to you? And she gave him a number and he struck a check, he struck a check, gave it to her. And, and he said, so as far as you and I are concerned and, and, and your business and dealings with my son, are we all OK? She said, yes, sir. Thank you so much for taking care of this situation. So then he proceeded to hire a lawyer. He called, asked his friends in Lafayette, because he was living in Houston, who's the best lawyer in Lafayette? And they gave him a name. Well, they at one time he was the best lawyer, but dad didn't know that now he had a drinking problem and things had changed a lot and he just wasn't really, the, and I'm not trying to beat him up, it happens to everybody, but he wasn't the best lawyer anymore in town. Anyway. Time goes by and now it's time for me to go to court. So I'm sitting in court and I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm just like this goofy teenage kid that all I'm worried about is when the next party's going to start. And I'm just thinking everything's perfectly fine and every, you know, it's all good. I still got my little long hair, you know, trying to think I'm David Lee Roth and all this other kind of stuff. And I'm sitting in the courtroom and the next thing you know, my, the judge calls everybody into chambers and they're sitting there for quite some time out of the scenario and then they come back in and the attorney says okay well everything's fine and you can go and I was like oh really okay well that's great and you know sure I got up and I walked out and my friend said hey Matt he said uh, I met up with Jackie well she was the woman who we had taken from and who my dad had paid money to she wants us to come over to her house and to hang out and party. I'm like, dude, that's kind of weird. I don't really want to go to that lady. She was kind of an older lady anyway. You know, I'm like, I don't really want to go. No, he said, I think you really need to come because she's got, she wants to tell you what happened. So we go over to her house and she begins to tell us the story about what actually happened behind the scenes. She said, son, you were about to go to, to Paris jail for a year. Like they were getting ready to sentence you to a year in the Paris jail. Your lawyer hadn't done anything that he was basically supposed to do and whenever and I showed up because of the fact that I wanted to make sure justice was served and I wanted to represent you because your father took the time to pay me back what was owed me and the other person never I haven't gotten any restitution from what the other person did. And so what happened was is that she got back there. She started to defend me and she told the court. She said, where's the other guy? They're talking about what other guy? The other guy that was with him. He hasn't paid any kind of restitution. I, I, he, th this young man, his father, paid me the money back. I dropped all charges against this young man whenever his father paid. Why are y'all even charging him? And where's the other guy? We have no record of there being anybody else involved. So what ended up happening, to tell you the story, was that the police contacted me afterwards and they said, we need some names. We need some names you know, information, blah, blah, blah. Well, I thought I was some kind of street gangster. I was just this stupid little teen. And I'm like, dude, I ain't telling on nobody. You leave me alone. And I hung up the phone. Well, lo and behold, my friend, who was from New York City and obviously been in trouble on more than one occasion, knew, at least in his mind, it's time for me to sing. I didn't know that. He started giving people's name. The police dropped the charges against him, but they wanted me to go to jail because of the fact that I hung up on them and told them I wasn't going to tell them nothing. 
But this woman went back there and she said, no, the, the restitution's been paid. The payment's been paid. Charges have been dropped against him. I don't want to press charges on him. And anyway, whenever it was all said and done, the judge, by his, you know, being gracious, allowed the charges to be dropped in that situation, allowed me not to go to jail, allowed me to go home. Basically, I told that story because that's kind of like the idea of justification. My father represented me in that situation and he paid a debt to, to fix and to absolve that particular situation. Uh, I couldn't pay the debt, but the debt was paid. And whenever that debt was paid, from that moment moving forward, I was no longer, even though I was guilty, I wasn't held accountable for what I had previously done. And and what we need to understand is, is that my dad represented me in that situation, but Jesus was our representative yes. man. Jesus was our representative man, and he went before us, and he paid a debt and a penalty that you nor I couldn't pay. And even though you or I were guilty in what it was that we had done, the Father is willing to look at the payment that Jesus paid and say, you're absolved of all crimes, you're absolved of all guilt, you're no longer guilty, now I see you as innocent, amen? amen. And that was just this illustration that I wanted to, to start off with to try to give you a basic understanding of what it means to be justified. You know, justification too, you have to understand, is it based upon a feeling? Justification is based upon what God's word says that justification is. And if God says that you're pronounced innocent of all charges based on what Jesus did, first off, you have to know that that's what God's word says in order to be able to believe it. Once you know it, now you can begin to believe it. Amen. And you, as you begin to believe it and you look, because see, the enemy is going to constantly try to come at you and whisper to you a different word than what God's word says. That's what he did to Eve in the garden. And that's what he does to people all of the time. He whispers to them and he, and he tries to convince them of something contrary to what God's word says. And so he'll constantly tell you that you're guilty. Some people that you know, they'll also want you to believe that you're guilty, right? But what I'm here to tell you is, is that the word of God says that if you've put faith in Christ and his sacrifice for what he's done for you, then what the father sees is he sees innocence and he has declared you to be so. Now, I like to talk about outlines and I like to break stuff down. I would say we're going to we're going to spend a little time on Romans five and six over the next couple of weeks. But um, I saw one outline that broke down Romans five into two main categories. Verses 1 through 11 talk to, talks about the blessings of our justification. We're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. And verses 12 through 21 talks about the basis of our justification. Now, a lot of times in the past, whenever I would talk about uh, the book of Romans, I would try to explain or to give a little bit of review or background information about how the whole book started to get us up to the point where we are right now. So where we are right now is Romans chapter 5 and the first passage when, that when I first read it said, therefore being justified by faith. The word therefore is a conjunction that connects two things. It connects where we are now to what was behind it. To what preceded it. All right. So if we move backwards, what I just I'm going to make this quick. What I want you to know is, is that in Romans chapter three, I'm sorry, Romans one, starting at verse one, all the way through chapter three, verse twenty one, the apostle Paul, or shall I say verse twenty, the apostle Paul has been making a case that all men are guilty before God. In the eyes of God, mankind is guilty. You can't get around it. It doesn't matter who your mama is. It doesn't matter where you were born. In the eyes of God, all of mankind is pronounced guilty. All right. That's a, ba that's a main basis of the scripture. That's a main basis of the Bible. That's a main basis of why redemption even had to take place. What re redemption meaning a ransom had to be paid. That's the main basis on why the blood had to be shed. That's the, that's the main basis on why Christianity is the right way and every other way is the wrong way. 
Because everybody else is saying that there's some things that you can do in order to elevate yourself to a certain level. And then now you can finally, like for instance, Buddhism. You do enough karma, good stuff to other people, then guess what? At some point in time, you reach nirvana. You, 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 because of your works, you elevate yourself to a certain place. And most false religions are built in some way, shape, or form on a works-based system. Unfortunately, much of this has also crept into the Protestant church and the works-based system has replaced the work of Jesus and people put their faith in their works thinking that that's what makes them righteous. That's another story for another time. Paul says all men are guilty. He starts off in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and he talks about the fact that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of God's word that it liberates and sets the captive free. He begins to explain in Romans chapter 1 that the Gentile is guilty. The Gentile would be, we've explained this before, all those nations that did not know the God of Israel, that did not know the God that would give us Jesus. Essentially, a Gentile is anybody that's an unbeliever. Can we look at it like that? All Gentiles, those that weren't at that time Jewish people, were guilty. The reason that they were guilty, Paul said, was because they suppressed the truth. They suppressed the truth that had been given to them. So if a man or a woman finds themselves in hell one day, it won't be because uh, God put them there. It will be because they suppressed the truth that was given to them. Now, I don't mean to get into get into it too deep, but, but we're going to get into it deep because, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that we prayed for someone this morning and, you know, uh, a family member. And this was actually one of the things that had been brought out in one of my conversations with him and, and another uncle at one of these one of these uh, these get togethers. And I know that you've experienced it also. That's why I want to bring it up. Yeah. But what about the person in Africa that never heard the gospel? See, because that's what it says in the book of Romans. It says that men suppress the truth through the invisible thing, through the, what, what, that which you can't see and that which you can't see, that which God has created through creation. God has made it aware to mankind and also put something on the inside of them that they would know the truth when they hear it and that they would know that God is real and that they would even question in their own hearts and minds when they see the beautiful fluffy clouds uh, parade across the sky, the sun keep rising, the moon rising at certain times and all of these things regarding creation creation causing them. I don't know if you've ever done it, but even listen, I was a kid that had heard about Jesus, but I can remember driving down the road and thinking there is more to this. There is something going on that's bigger than me. And listen, it's in you. And the problem with the atheist and the problem with the one who doesn't believe in God is that he has convinced himself that, it, that God isn't real. And now his heart has become hardened to the truth. But in the book of Romans chapter one, it says this, they suppressed the truth. They hold down the truth in unrighteousness. When they hear the truth, they suppress it. They hold it down. And because of that, the, the guilt of the, their guilt remains within them. OK, I need. And so in that conversation that I had, the guy says, but the people in Africa never heard. Well, hold on a second. One of the things that we need to understand is this. It's not God's fault. The sin of man is in God's fault. And the, the, the continuous going forth of the gospel, if it has stopped in any place for today, is not God's fault. The point that I'm trying to make is this. Now, this is what I tried to explain to him. I said, listen, sir, because of decisions that you've made, you've been told the gospel by people that loved you. But through the years, you chose to suppress that truth that you were given. Because of that, your children don't believe the gospel because they haven't had the opportunity. You rejected the gospel. It didn't just affect you, sir. It affected your children also. And guess what? God has always had a witness in the land. The same way that a witness was sent to you and you suppressed it and therefore it was suppressed to your offspring. God from the beginning of time has had a witness in the land. He witnessed to the serpent. 
He witnessed to Adam. He witnessed to Eve. And listen, after Abel died, Cain knew the truth, but he suppressed the truth and built a civilization that was void of the truth. Listen to me. Seth was of the lineage of the righteousness of God. Seth spread the truth of the gospel. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that mankind has heard the truth. But yet, many, in many cases, mankind suppresses the truth. And when man suppresses the truth, it doesn't just affect the one that suppressed it. It affects the everyone else that's involved. Not just individual people have suppressed it. Entire nations have suppressed the truth. That's why you can, they say you can fly over Jamaica and the grass is green. And when you get into Haiti, everything is brown and dead. And it's because they have suppressed all manner of truth. And instead they have embraced voodoo and black magic. And everything relates to death. We could go on and on about, you know, Sudan. And what they're talking, you know, very. Various places like that where the food is stolen from the people. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that and the fact that Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been suppressed in all of these places. But none of that is God's fault. It's man's fault. Well, it's not fair. Hold on a second. Every human being is found guilty. And we'll get into that more next week. Is found guilty already, whether they've ever heard of God, whether they've ever heard of the law of God, they've already been found guilty because of the fact that they were born of Adam and they were born in a state of guiltiness because of their connection with Adam. He is our representative man and our first birth. We received guilt from him, but thank God we have another representative man. All right. So the Jew is the Gentile is guilty because he has suppressed the truth. And it has affected everything around him. But Jews are guilty also because even though they, didn't, they had the law, they didn't keep the law. That's what it says. If you'll put Romans chapter 3 verses 9 through 10 up there. Ultimately, this is kind of like the Apostle Paul. This is a summary, I guess you would say, of the, all the verses of Scripture where he's been building the case against the Jew too. Because see, as he's building the case against the Gentile and these People are reading it, yeah, well, we've been knowing the Gentiles are guilty. Duh. <laughs> you know, like they didn't ever have God. Well, Paul's like, hold on a second. You think just because you're a Jew that you're okay? Same, same thing goes for the Christian. That's how we get high and mighty and self-righteous in our own minds. Because we think, well, now I'm saved and look at them. They're not saved. And look what I, but many times what happens is, is that we look at what we do as opposed to what they do. And, and then we judge down on them. Hold on a second. It has nothing to do with what you do versus what they do other than your doing of faith and believing in what God provided. That's what changed your, situa your situation. That's what's changed your position, right? And that's what made you right in the eyes of God, not what you do versus what they do, but, your, uh, but faith. You <laughs> received the gospel. You didn't suppress the truth. You embraced the truth. And when you did that, you became justified. All right. And so he says right here in, in Romans 3, 9 through 10, what then? Are we better than they? No. So he's, Paul's a Jew and he's asking his, bro, his Jewish brothers, are we better than the Gentiles? No, in no wise, in no way. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. All right, so once again, we're back in chapter 5, and we, we began this passage of Scripture where it says, therefore, and it was in reference to the thought of justification, therefore being justified by faith. And so Paul starts off saying everybody's guilty, but look at Romans 3.21, because he introduces, he's over here making a case, everybody's guilty, Jew and Gentile, Gentile Jew, everybody's guilty, there's none righteous, no, not one. But then in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, there's a transition that happens. Now he introduces righteousness. We've used this scripture a lot in the church. I love this scripture because it's one of the examples where if you read on, <laughs> this is an example where it's actually talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified. But what you'll see is, is that uh, you don't necessarily see the word cross right here, but this is exactly what it's talking about. Because God's plan of Jesus Christ and him crucified has been for thousands of years. This thing has been in the process. But he says, look at this. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. 
I've asked this question every time I've read that scripture. What does that mean right there? The first part of that verse, part A, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. What does righteousness mean right there? What do, what do you think Paul's saying? If anybody wants to throw something out there, you can. If not, I'm about to answer. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Somebody said Jesus. Whoever said Jesus was right. It's Jesus. All right. Mm -hmm. The word Jesus. It, the Jesus isn't in there. Yeah, because but God's righteousness was manifested. See, Paul's over here talking about the law. The law said this. The law showed this. The law showed God's righteousness. The law showed God's character. But mankind could not keep the law. Now, the, now Paul's saying, now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, has been manifested. The, the righteousness of God, which was in heaven, clothed himself, tinted himself in flesh, and came to the earth. God's righteousness now has been manifest in physical form where your physical eyes can see it. Then he goes on to say, being witnessed. What does that mean? This righteousness had been witnessed by the law and the prophets. The Old Testament was a witness to the righteousness that would come. Amen? And the Old Testament told us the story that this righteousness was going to come, and now Paul's saying it actually is here. So there's a transition. Man's not, man was guilty, but now God shows us righteousness. Now the question is, because we're on the therefore, how do we get... The righteousness that's been manifested in Jesus over to the guilty mankind that's been born of Adam. And that's where we are in Romans 5. But listen, he brings us first to Romans 4. That's therefore we got to back up to Romans 4. Let's take a look at Romans 4 and verses 1 through 8. If we could just go ahead and read that together. It says, what shall we say then? That Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found. In other words, he's saying flesh meaning works. What did Abraham accomplish in his own strength to get this done? He says, for if Abraham were justified by works, he has wear up to glory, but not before God. So if Abraham could have done it on his own, in his own strength, with his own works, then he, said, he could have said, hey, God, look at what I did. All right, next verse. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God. It doesn't say Abraham worked for God. It says Abraham believed God and it was counted. Don't, don't change the screen just yet. I want you to see something. It was counted unto him for righteousness. I want you to see that word counted right there. I want you to just keep that in your mind because it has a meaning in the Greek. All right, next, uh, next verse. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. So if you got a job, you go to work, you work a week, your, your employer owes you money. But, but Abraham didn't work for what he had coming to him. Next, next verse. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Next verse. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. I'm not going to walk back over there again, but if you could go back to that. Imputed. You see that word right there, imputed, on the screen? That word and the word counted is the same word in the Greek. I just wanted you to be aware of that. So what David is saying is the same thing that, that Abraham said. But look, so, so listen, that, that's good enough right there. Let's go back to the idea. Therefore, being justified by faith. That's in Romans chapter 5. We're backing up. We're going to Romans 4. We're about to get to Romans 5. Just give me a second. We're laying the foundation. Paul uses two examples of Old Testament characters to describe the fact that justification was already in existence. This has always been God's plan. All right. He uses Abraham and David. Two of the, if you start off in the, Old, in the New Testament and you read the genealogy of Jesus, it tells you that he was the seed of Abraham and it tells you that he was the seed of David. Amen. These are the two largest characters, really, of the Old Testament regarding the Jewish people. And now the example he uses is Abraham. Abraham was an example of how faith results in righteousness. That word counted literally means, if, just, just bear with me, I'm just going to say it real simple, that God put righteousness in Abraham's account based upon his faith. Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. The word accounted in this English translation literally means to put into the account God put righteousness in Abraham's account based upon his faith 
in God's word. But listen, I always talk to you about this. Faith must have an object. Faith is a very abstract concept. We've talked about that before. In other words, if you say how, somebody might even say, how do you know you're getting into heaven? Because I have faith. Well, what do you have faith in? I have faith in God. Okay, that, that's, that, that, that's true. But whenever we're getting down into how do I walk with God? What am I really supposed to, how am I supposed to believe God as I'm going through things in life? It's a little bit more specific than that. I used to like the way Lauren used to say this. So for all of you that don't like the fact that I'm actually looking into Greek words and trying to parse it all out and dissect it like I do, that's how I do. I remember what Lauren Larson said one time. You don't really have to know much of anything to get saved, but you got to know some stuff to stay saved. Amen. You don't need to know nothing hardly to get saved. You just need to know you're a sinner, that there was a sacrifice for your sin and believe it. But as you walk this journey out, you gonna have to learn some stuff. In order to have your faith properly focused. Mm -hmm. I got faith in God. Well, hold on a second. What is the faith that God requires? So Abraham believed God, but faith must have an object. Now, you can just, I'm giving you the fast version here. But the object of Abraham's faith was Jesus Christ and him crucified. Wait, hold on a second, preacher. Abraham was 2,000 years before Abraham. I know, and I know we've talked about this a little bit here recently, but listen. He believed God's word about the seed that would bless all the nations. God said through your seed, all nations shall be blessed. Was Abraham able at that point in time to foresee that from him would come Jesus and that Jesus would die on the cross? No, not exactly like that. But he believed God based upon the word that God gave him. And God gave him a word that from him, from his loins, a seed would come that would bless all nations of the earth. And even though he couldn't see it in the physical, even though he couldn't believe it because it looked impossible, Abraham believed God according to that word and God put it in his account as righteousness. He also believed God's word about the sacrifice because he obeyed God when he put wood on Isaac's back and brought him up the hill to offer him as a sacrifice. The father offering the son as a sacrifice, which was fulfilled by father God when he offered his son Jesus on the cross. Isaac was the seed and the sacrifice, the representative which was ultimately fulfilled by Jesus, if that makes sense. My, in Isaac was Christ. You, you, can you see that? Can you see young Isaac carrying wood up a hill to be a sacrifice? And while he is not Jesus, he is a forerunner and a type of Jesus. And God says, you may not know what's coming down the line, but I know exactly what's coming down the line. And I just need you to believe my word according to what it says. And I need you to do what it is that I've asked you to do. You believed me that he would be born. Now I'm asking you to believe me that I can raise him up. And Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him as righteousness. So Abraham's faith resulted in God being able to put righteousness in someone's account. David, on the other hand, he said that blessed is the man to whom God doesn't impute sin. So Abraham's blessed with righteousness in his account. David said, blessed is the man who God doesn't put sin in his account. Because remember, imputeth. And counted are the same word in the Greek. Abraham got righteousness in his account. David got a lack of guilt in his account. And the reality of it is, is that we know that David was guilty. After his sin with Bathsheba, what I, what I need you to know is that there still has to be an object of faith. What was it that David believed God about? Well, once again, the word was given to David that after he would die, we're not going to necessarily go there, but in 2 Samuel 7.13... He was promised that the seed would also come from him. I'm telling you, David, I am going to rise up a seed that's going to have an eternal throne. It's never going to stop. And that was talking about Jesus. And David was left with a situation with who he was going to honor to be the king that was going to replace him. And he put Solomon on the throne. And it was through Solomon that that uh, that Joseph's lineage came anyway. But so I wanted you to see that. But but not only that, after he sinned with Bathsheba, if you if you would, we're not going to go there. But in Psalm 51, he cries out to God and he says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Now, you have to understand that when you study the scriptures the way the Jewish people did, 
Jewish people understood things about the Bible that you and I probably didn't necessarily understand, even though we had studied the Bible for a long time, especially regarding the Old Testament. You got to understand something about King David. He knew the scriptures. Young Jewish boys studied the scriptures. The way we talk about the Passover in this church, they knew it better than we did because they had been telling, been told that story every single year, all of their life. You know how all, you know how many times I've told the story of the Passover in here to the point where it's kind of like sometimes I start apologizing for it, even though I shouldn't apologize for it. Because I feel like I'm telling y'all the same thing over and again. Should never apologize for that. Because they were constantly being told that. That was on the back. So whenever David realizes that he's guilty. And listen to me. I've studied this out. In the law, there was no provision for the two sins that David committed. He, he committed adultery. And he was caught by the prophet Nathan. Called him out. But not only that, he tried to kill Uriah. Well, he did. I'm sorry. Kill Uriah. The Hittite, which was Bathsheba's husband. It was a pre-planned, premeditated murder in order to cover up his sin. Both of those sins required stoning. But what David did was he cried out to be cleansed with hyssop. Well, what does that have anything to do with anything, preacher? Hyssop is the very substance, the very plant that would grow out of the cracks and walls, would also grow. It was an absorbent plant, and it's the very plant that they used to dip in the blood of the Passover lamb when they painted the doorpost and the side post. David is saying, Lord, the same way you delivered Israel out from their bondage, the same way. And listen, it gets even deeper than that, but I don't have time because it also has something to do with the ashes of the red heifer and the cleansing of the impure, the cleansing of the unclean. He was unclean. The cleansing of those that had touched dead people. He had touched dead people. His hands was all over dead Uriah and he was crying out to God, Lord, I need you to cleanse me. Strike the door post of my heart with hyssop. I need you to put the blood. I'm crying out for the blood. He had an object of faith. Guilt, therefore, was not imputed unto him. It was not placed in his account, but it wasn't based on anything that he had done. It wasn't because he fasted. It wasn't because he put himself in sackcloth. It wasn't because he laid on the floor and refused to eat. No, it was because he cried out to God and he put faith in God, knowing that God delivers and forgives based on the shedding of blood. Faith in the seed and the sacrifice. Jesus Christ and him crucified is the only faith that justifies. So justification means to be declared, be declared innocent by God. And now that we've established what the therefore means, I want to talk to you about three of the blessings that come from being justified. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. The first one is peace with God. Number one, blessing that comes from justification is peace with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That word peace right there literally means to bind together that which has been separated. If you could imagine two garments being torn and then somebody coming back and sewing them back together. So sin ripped us apart from the presence of God, but the work of Jesus brings peace back to man to bind together that which has been separated. Let's take a look at Colossians chapter one, verse 20. And having made peace, through the blood of his cross. That's, that's Jesus. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say. Whether they be things in earth. Or things in heaven. To reconcile. Means to bring back. A former state of harmony. So there was a former state of harmony. And we talked about this last week. I believe it was. Where Adam spent time in the presence of God. There was a harmonious relationship where man's presence and God's presence were able to be in unity with one another. But sin separated and ripped that apart. But the blood of Jesus reconciled and brought peace back into the situation. He's bringing things back to a former state of harmony. You know, the reason that a lot of people don't realize that they need God is because they don't understand or believe what his word says about guilt or innocence. They feel like they're okay, so they don't need to hear what the preacher says and they don't need to hear what the Christian has to say. Uh, but righteousness has nothing to do with the way we feel, right? 
Righteousness has nothing to do with the way we feel. Instead, right, being right with God is related to what his word says about what righteousness is. As a matter of fact, we used to use this when we first started the Bible study. I remember us talking about this quite a bit. That word enmity. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15, this word enmity. It means, the word enmity means to be in hostility with God. It means to be an enemy of God. It means to be at war with God. This says, having abolished in his flesh, it means through his death, the enmity, the hostility, the war, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Now, you got to understand that the context of what's going on here is he's talking about Jew versus Gentile. He's talking about how in Jesus, there's no longer two different kind of people of God. There's only one people of God and that there was enmity between both Jew and Gentile. In other words, hostility between God and man, but that just as there was hostility between Jew and Gentile, but that what Jesus has done and that the law, sorry, made and the ordinances made both guilty, but that what Jesus has done has now made peace and made one man, one type of believer out of of the two. The law of God is broken because of man, therefore sin from Adam and a continued breaking of the law puts man in a place of hostility with God. Before Jesus died on the cross, there were two barriers. I wanted you to see this. Before Jesus died on the cross, there were two barriers that prevented people from having access to the presence of God. The first barrier was the wall that separated the court of the Gentiles from the actual temple. During Herod's time frame, Herod's temple, there was a wall that stood up and separated and did not allow Gentiles to cross past the wall. They had their own court where they could do, they, if there was certain types of things that had to take place, or even there were some Gentiles that wanted to serve the God of the Jews, but they weren't allowed to go past that wall. And there was a, a, one little thing that I read actually said there was a sign on there that said if a Gentile tries to pass this wall, then, then death is the result. So there was a wall that separated the Gentiles from being able to go into the presence of the Lord. And for the Jew, there was a veil that separated the common man from being able to go into the presence of the Lord. We talked about the veil. We talked about the holy place many times, right? But, but because both Jew and Gentile, like we talked about earlier, were guilty. And essentially, what needs to be understood here is that before Jesus died, there was a separation between God and man. Man's sin was like the veil and the wall that kept him separate from the presence of God. But the death of Jesus removed the barriers. Let's look at Matthew 27, 51. Matthew 27, 51. Many of you have read this story before or read this part of the story. This is after Jesus is dying and he, get, and he gives up the spirit of God. He's, he's actually died on the cross. It says, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. In other words, the rocks split. There was an earthquake. But the earthquake didn't cause the veil to rip. What you need to understand is the spirit of God ripped that veil. I remember reading that a long, several, several years ago out of one of the commentaries of Brother Swagger, and he talked about, he quoted Josephus. Josephus, the Jewish historian. He said that the veil was the breadth of a man's hand, of embroidered fabric. We don't have time to get into all of this, but you imagine whenever you see a veil and that the high priest is going behind it, that, and this is a whole other story for another time, that there was actually already a split to it. They just weren't allowed to go through it, so they would just split the veil in two. No, that's not what the case is. The, the tradition of the Jews is that they were actually translated through there. It brought the censer with them, and God allowed it, made an opening for them to be able to go through. There was no splitting of an opening. This veil was one piece of material that was the breadth of a man's hand in the Bible, and not the Bible. Josephus said that two yoke of oxen could not have pulled or ripped this veil apart. Yet, whenever Jesus died, the earth quaked, the rock split, the veil from the top to the bottom, was some 40 feet high, the veil from the top to the bottom was split, which signified that the way into the presence of God was now made available for all. Before Jesus died, there was a barrier for the Gentiles. There was a wall that prevented them from entering the presence of God. Before Jesus died, there was a veil that separated and did not allow 
the Jewish people to get in. Look at Ephesians 2, 14 through 18. This is some of the context of that Ephesians passage we were just reading. It says, He is our peace. Talking about Jesus. Who has made both one. Once again, we're talking about the, there's no more separation between Jew and Gentile. And has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. He's talking about that wall <clears throat> that used to stand in the way and prevented the Gentiles from getting in. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that hostility, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. All man is guilty because he's broken the law. For to make in himself of twain, both Jew and Gentile, make him one man, so he's made peace. And that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity or the hostility thereby. And he came and preached peace to you, which were afar off. You Gentiles that didn't know God. You Gentiles that were out without the commandments and without the covenants. You were far away from the message of Jesus Christ. You didn't even know that there was a God in heaven that was promising that he would send Messiah. You were far away. But the message goes forth to preach to you, but also to you that were nigh, which means near. To you, the Jew also. There's not two different ways to get to the God the Father. Right. There was one preacher, and whatever, I mean, I don't want to, I'm not even going to say his name. I mean, it's not that I'm scared to say names, y'all know that. But I did Google it before, and I think that Aaron went back and researched it, but I'm going to cut him some slack today. That was saying that there's two different ways for people to get saved. Two different ways, like different for the Jew than it is for the Gentile. No, it's not. That's against the word of God. It says right here that there's, there's one way. He said, preach to you which were far off, and you that were nigh, for through him we both. Jew and Gentile have access by one spirit unto the Father. Mm -hmm. Because of Jesus' death, the Holy Spirit gives us access into the presence of God. This is really point number one, access. Ac I'm sorry, point number one was peace with God. And this brings us to point number two, access to God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Mankind born in Adam is born in sin his sin is hostile towards the holiness of God and puts in him in enmity with God. Amen. And so, but now God has provided a way to bring peace to men together, that which is separated, to remove the enmity, to remove the hostility, and that allows us to have access to God. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know, I was going to write this thing up here to try to explain what I was talking about as far as for access. I used to use this illustration a long time ago. Uh, this first box would be the believer, which is you. And your faith. And for sake of time, I'm just going to put the word sacrifice, but well, you know what? I'll put seed, which means Jesus, and sacrifice, right? And I don't, I'm not a very good artist, but this is supposed to be a key, all right? We're talking about access. Because of the hostility and the enmity that was previously in us because of our first birth in Adam, we did not have access to the presence of God. Amen. But the good news is this, is that when the believer puts faith in God's provision, the object of faith being Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross is the key that opens the door to grace for the believer and allows grace to flow into his life. We've been given access to grace. So continued, listen, so what do I do when I'm going through something, preacher? Just make it simple for me. Okay, I'm going to make it simple for you. When you're going through something, you need to be reminded each and every day, each and every minute, each and every circumstance, whatever it is that you're going through, whether you're being bombarded with sin, whether you're being bombarded with, with fear, whether you're being bombarded with doubt, that Jesus 
died to set you free, that Jesus gave you righteousness, and that if you will keep your faith in there, it gives you access to grace. But I don't feel it. Well, guess what, baby? Keep on believing because that's what the Word of God says. He ain't changing his plan. Keep on believing God that this is the answer. And as you do, I need your righteousness, Lord, but I know that you provided it. Hallelujah. I know that I'm justified. Therefore, being justified by faith, I have peace with God and I have access into this grace in which I stand. Whatever it is that you need this morning in your life, I'm telling you the answer. The answer is God's grace. A divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the light. What does that mean? God does something on the inside and it happens so much so that it's manifest on the outside. Listen to me. Each and every situation, each and every circumstances, you and I need the grace of God. God has provided access to his grace through faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God and we have access into this grace in which we stand. Part of that word access describes to bring to the face of. I'm not going to get into all the compound word and all that for lack of time. But the idea is that man was separated from the presence of God where grace flows. By the way, this may be, to, you may not even think like I do, but I, I ask questions. So what is grace? I want to know what grace is. I'm here to tell you grace comes from the Holy Ghost. The first time I tried to tell a preacher this, he just looked at me like I was stupid. I was like, dude, this is revelation. The grace comes from the Holy Ghost. Everything that you receive on this earth today comes from the person of the Holy Spirit, but he can provide it in your life because of what Jesus did at the cross. That's right. This is the key. Jesus dying on the cross is the key that opens your life, opens the door to you to receive grace from God, the presence of God, moving and operating in your life. Right. Whatever it is you need. But I don't feel like it. I'm tired. I'm hurt. And I'm depressed. Guess what? God's grace can get you through. That's right. That's right. God's grace can be the medicine for your soul. Amen. God's grace can be joy in your heart. Amen. God's grace can be strength in your bones. Amen. God's grace can get you through. Amen. I've told this story before, and I don't ask, I ask you not to go look on Snopes because I'm not that convinced that it's a real story, but it, it's a good story that tells what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make. We're talking about access. Uh, there was a man who was outside of the White House during Lincoln's administration. He was frantically trying to get into the White House because he had some information that he knew that the president needed. And all of his attempts had fallen on deafened ears. Because, you know, the guards are out there, the whatever. I don't know if they had secret service back then or what it looked like. But the point is, is that they had people that were guarding the house. But it wasn't like it is now, obviously. I mean, it was a little easier access. And falling on deaf and ears. But so there he sat, defeated on a nearby bench. And all of a sudden, this little boy came skipping by. And he noticed the boy with his head, the, the man, I'm sorry, with his head hung low and in his hands. And he's and the, and the young boy says, it says, what, what's wrong, kind sir? What, what's going on? You look down. And, and, and the man says, I have extremely important information that I need to tell the president. The safety of the country lies in this information, but I can't convince the guards to let me talk to the president. The young boy simply smiled and he grabbed the man's hand and said, follow me, kind sir. They began to walk back towards the White House and past the guards that previously barricaded the man from the presence of the president and into an office where the president was meeting with other men. And once the door opened, the president said, who is this man? And the little boy responded, I found him on a bench outside and he looked very sad. I was taught that I should try to help other people if I can. So I asked him what was wrong. And he said that he had something important to tell the president, but that he couldn't get in to see the president. So he was very sad. So here he is, Father. I knew I could help him with that. I knew I could get him in here. And now he has something that he needs to tell you. The man had no access. There was no way that he was going to get past those guards. But yet this young boy had unfettered access. And essentially that's what Jesus did for us. When he died on the cross, he opened up the doorway. He gave us access to the presence of God. Let's look at this. Look at, let's look at this particular uh, verse of scripture. And actually I was going to do a whole thing on Christian character, but I'm going to close it down after this. I'm going to finish this thought right here. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 20. Having therefore, brethren, 
boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now, I want you to imagine that veil that separated man, the Jews from the presence of God. I want you to imagine on that day, Jesus dying and that veil being ripped. And I want you to imagine the author of Hebrews, which I believe to be the Apostle Paul. And he's explaining to us, this is the result of Jesus' blood. The veil, which was his flesh, was ripped. His blood was shed. His sacrifice was offered. Because of that, you now can have boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies, to access the presence of God, to access the grace of God. That's what the Word of God says. You know, there was a, a preacher that I used to sit under. His name was Brad Bullock. And I know that Brad and I, we certainly did not agree on everything, you know, and he'd be the first to tell you that. But I tell you, I had did, I learned some things from him. And this is probably the most profound thing that I remember him ever saying, at least for me anyway. There was a time whenever he did this teaching on the tabernacle, and some of you that were there will remember it. I mean, we had this very talented woman in the church. Oh, she made this thing here, but you should have seen she made, she, this is styrofoam. I mean, she made this thing out of styrofoam, and I mean, it looks pretty rich. She, she built an altar of sacrifice, life-size, a, a, a brazen labor. They constructed a tent in the back. When you walked into the sanctuary, the whole thing was like you were walking into the, the, the courtyard of the, of the tabernacle. It was amazing. Yes. And I remember him getting up there because, man, we were moving through, dude. We had come to the altar. And he even said, well, he was preaching some good stuff, too, when he was preaching that, man. He was talking about the first thing that you got to do business with is the altar of sacrifice. You're not moving any forward till you come to the altar of sacrifice. Boy, we just steadily each week we made our progress towards the Holy of Holies. And he stood up and he said, I got to tell you, man. He said, I, I, I got to ask the Lord to forgive me because here I am. I'm over here just rushing in, man. I'm ready to get in beyond the veil. I'm ready to go through the veil and we're going to open it up and we're going to talk about the mercy seat. And he said, the Lord struck my heart and said, you can't pass up the veil. You can't pass up the veil because that was my flesh that was ripped. That's good. That was my flesh that was ripped. That was me that died. There was a, there was a, a, a separation. So, so sometimes we call it the fact that it was sin that separated. And it was. Sin separated us. But Jesus took our sin upon him and his flesh paid the penalty for that sin. And I just remember him saying this and I thought this was so good. He said, if you're having a hard time entering into the presence of God, if I'm having a hard time entering into the presence of God, I submit something to you this morning. It's not his flesh that's standing in the way. His flesh was ripped. It's your flesh. It's my flesh that stands in the way. The opening to the presence of God has been made available because of what Jesus did. And if there's something preventing us from getting in, it's not him. It's us.